Um, I'm going to begin today with a uh, review uh, of some of the things that I said um, yesterday for, for people who, who may not have been, been here or, been, been at, or, or say. So, um, the general theme, also kind of just a summary for everyone, the, the general theme of the, of the series of talks is that there's some kind of analogy between the ring of integers on the one hand um, and the ring of uh, polynomials over, over a finite field fq on the other hand, uh, and this lets us transfer first uh, definitions uh, and then also theorems and, and, and problems uh, between the classical setting of number theory and, 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 and the setting of kind of what we, what we call function field number theory because this is, well, the, the field of fractions of this is the field of functions on a, on a particular algebraic curve. Um, and this can then, these problems in their new setting can be related to um, to, to geometry and topology uh, over, over the finite field FQ. Um, and the way that this works is that we, we take our original problem, many different problems in number theory can be expressed in terms of counting something, ca counting numbers of a specific form or tuples of numbers of a specific form or something like that, um, which in this setting of polynomials or finite fields gives us counting solutions to polynomial equations over finite fields. So counting uh, solutions to polynomials over FQ. Uh, and this can be related to uh, calculating cohomology groups. Um, and as you would know, if you either went to the previous talk or were paying attention to what people were doing around here in the 1960s, which I don't know if anyone <laughs> was there, but uh, the, the, the formula is that the number of FQ points contained on a variety is equal to the sum from I equals zero to twice the dimension of X minus one to the I trace of Frobenius acting on the i compactly supported cohomology of x over fq bar with coefficients in the attic numbers. Okay, well, let me draw one thing, more thing on, on this board before I uh, send it up. There's another analogy relating geometry and topology over the finite field, which we often express using Italic cohomology, to geometry and topology over the complex numbers, which we can express using any cohomology theory, most commonly singular cohomology. Um, so, uh, and 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 the the. Lefschetz fixed point formula lets us rigorously reduce problems about counting solutions to polynomial equations to problems about calculating cohomology groups. And the um, other two analogies are only sometimes a rigorous relation, and other times we just have to use work on one side um, as inspiration for, for work on the other side. Um, Uh, and 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 this um, is kind of 
the summary of what I'm going to talk about in the next few talks. I'm going to use this bridge uh, in cases where we have a problem of interest on the number theory side and, and we look at how it transforms as we, we travel along this, uh, this bridge and, and, and we get also an interesting problem on, on the complex side. So we, ha we, have, we have topics which are kind of, of independent interest fr from, from both directions. Um, Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. So today I'll be talking about rational points. Money is conjecture. The topology of spaces of curves in varieties uh, and the circle method. So um, I'm, I'm going to Begin in a number theory setting. I'm going to begin uh, with a variety inside the projective space over the rational numbers. Um, so I just mean the solution set to some, some polynomial equations. Um, and then I'll make a simplifying assumption. Um, which is that if you look at the first churn class of the tangent bundle of the variety, this should equal A times the class of a generator of, of the cohomology of a protected space with so a class of a hyperplane in protected space uh, for some rational number A. So this is a small variety? Uh, yes. With protective variety. And you ignore torsion, so it's in cohomology of this. Yeah. Or in char group, or in which cohomology theory is it? Um, so uh, I was thinking of singular cohomology with rational coefficients. Um, it, uh, it doesn't matter super much because I'll be very rapidly restricting to the case that A is positive. And when A is positive, this forces the variety to be Fano, which means there's no, which means it's simply connected. So there won't be torsion. Um, so, so um, but yeah, this, is, this is in H2, the coefficients in Q. I'm thinking of it. Uh, and then a basic question in number theory, going back in some form thousands of years, is the question of how many uh, rational points are there on V. Um, and The 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 kind of conjectural answer that mathematicians came to over over the 20th century, I guess, is that it depends a lot on this number a. It depends a lot on on the on the tangent bundle of uh, of of the variety, whether its churn class is positive or negative. So, if a is greater than zero. We expect to have kind of many rational points, many rational solutions of these equations. If a is less than zero, we expect to have few. And if a is equal to zero, we have 
It's kind of un the most unclear case, kind of an intermediate uh, amount, but people are usually the, the most cautious making conjectures. Uh, in, in, in this case. So, for, so for, the, for the negative case, the, um, the conjecture should be that they're not Zariski dense. Um, uh, this is a, um, so there's some proper closed subset of a variety that all the rational points are contained in. Um, the many has to be interpreted because sometimes they are known, like with the very broad varieties. Of Correct. So you have to extend the field suitably to do it. To yes. So right. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to make a more more precise statement shortly. But yeah, m many. So I don't want to extend the field. What, 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 what the, kind, the form of the statement I want to make is that there is going to be many unless there's a good reason not, and I should have a list of all the good reasons not. So the precise statement there should be many if there's no local obstruction or uh, a Brouwer mean obstruction. Um, and I will explain what a local obstruction is. I, I might not explain what a brown or obstruction is because it's not relevant for the specific examples. I'm going to spend the most time on it in, in the talk, but I, I can explain if somebody wants to know. Um, uh, and um, what I want to focus on in this talk is, is the, the many case, the case where A is positive, making this many statement. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how do we make this many statement more precise. Um, I mean, so obviously infinitely many is part of the conjecture. I mean, more precisely, Zariski dense is, is part of the conjecture. But we can make conjectures that are m even more precise th than that. Um, and, and to do that, we need, uh, we need height. I don't know if she had height. Um, oh, okay. Maybe, maybe first of all I should say, if V is the vanishing locus of polynomials F, F1 up to Fk of degrees D1 through Dk, uh, and then dimension v is the expected dimension n minus k, then a will just be n plus 1 minus d1 up to minus dk. You mean complete intersection, yeah? Yes, complete intersection. Um, yeah, so, 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 so the, for four complete intersections, this, 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 this formula a is, 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 is very easy to compute in terms of the degrees. Uh, and, and so the, the low degree case is going to be the case I'm focusing on in, in, in this talk. Um, and so to make this more precise, we need to look at the rational points, uh, not all at once. Um, we, we want to look at them only up to um, a specific size. And to do that, we need a notion of, of the height of, the, of a rational point. Um, so a uh, a rational point in projective space can be expressed by a, a tuple of rational numbers. Uh, which is well defined up to uh, scaling, to multiplying them all by a rational number. Um, uh, um, so, for such a point, define the height by scaling a0 
and until all are integers with no common factors, uh, and then taking the max. So you can always, by multiplying them by a suitable integer, clear the denominators and, and ensure they're all integers. And then by dividing by a suitable integer, we can ensure they have no common factors. So we have a tuple of integers with no common factors. And we take the max, uh, or the max of the absolute value. Max absolute value of AIs, and that's the height. Um, so a more precise question we can ask is how many uh, rational points, or let me say, x in v of q, or y in v of q, of height less than x as a function of x. Um, and uh, um, so the, the simplest example we can consider is when v is equal to projected space itself. Um, so how many how many points are there on projective space? So here that means any tuple of integers. Um, is, is, is valid. So the, the number of y in, I'll keep using absolute values, number of y in projective space over, over, Q, over the rationals with the height of y less than x uh, is equal to the number of tuples a0 through an in the integers where the maximum absolute value of ai is less than x. Uh, they have no common factors. Uh, and then we divide by 2 because negating a tuple gives you a tu the same point in protective space. Um, and we can, we can approximate um, what that is. So if we just consider points where the max is less than x, then each coordinate is totally independent. There's about 2x possibility, because it can range from plus x to minus x. So um, it's approximately equal to 2x to the n plus 1. Uh, and then no common factors, uh, that's, a, that's a succession of conditions. At each prime, we have a condition that there's no common, that p is not a common factor. Um, and if we choose the numbers at random, the probability that condition is satisfied is 1 minus p to the minus n plus 1. Um, so it's 2, and, and, and then these end up being you know, provably independent, so you get the product of over primes p of 1 minus p to the minus n minus 1. Uh, and then you divide by 2. Because uh, we have this division by 2 at the end. So we end up with 2 to the n over zeta of n plus 1, x to the n plus 1. Um, and so, um, so this is an asymptotic, so it'll be equal to this up to a, a lower order term in x. Um, and there's something already suggestive about this simple formula in the projective space case, which is that um, the exponent here is exactly the value of a. So the, 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 the churn class of projective space is n plus 1 times the hyperplane class, um, and it exactly matches this exponent. Um, 
So that is one of several things that motivates the conjecture of uh, Menin, later refined by Pair, uh, which is that uh, the number of rational points on V of height less than x uh, is approximately equal to x to the a times log x to the b times c, uh, where b is the rank of the group of algebraic line bundles on x minus 1. Uh, and C is some uh, explicit, and C, and, and C is explicit, some explicit constant. Uh, with with a subtlety um, the subtlety is once uh, after removing all rational points in finally many Uh, sub varieties of V or covers W to V by irreducible varieties Um, so let me let me. I, I want to put this uh, the, the, this caveat in, um, but I want to uh, ignore the caveat at first. Let me let me let me first explain what's going on with the statement, and then why we'll explain we need why we need to amend it. I, I understand what it means to remove points of finite many varieties. I don't understand what it means to cover for covers. What do you mean by so I mean, I mean, I mean that the image of the rational points of those covers we must remove. So yeah, so I, I, I care about rational, yeah, rational points of the covers. So um, uh, what is going on with this formula? So so this. So the formula is supposed to be a generalization of the formula we get um, in the projective space case, which is a constant times the power of a. In the general case, we need a constant times the power of log x uh, times, times, times x to the a. Um, and it's not very hard to see that the log x is necessary. If you just calculate, do this analogous calculation for a product of two projective spaces, you'll immediately see that a power of log x um, appears because the height will be the product of the heights on the two projective spaces, and, and, and you'll get an area under a hyperbola, and that will give you a logarithm. Um, uh, and also, it should, it should work for any choice of height function defined geometrically using certain. Yes. Um, Constant depends on the choice of the height function. Exa exactly, and so this, is, so this is kind of an important point, and this is so the 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 fact that I put an explicit constant here is doing maybe more than it looks like, um, because uh, I could just change I could change my variety slightly. I could change the embedding of projective space by some linear automorphism of projective space that would change the it would not change the rational points, because it's just, you know, just a linear transformation with rational coefficients, but it would change um, the height function. 
Um, and so to, to, to make my statement self-consistent, I, I, I have to think about, to, to choose the right constant, you have to think about um, how does the height of a point change as you go from, from one to another, and how the point um, changes depends on what that point looks like uh, at each place. So what it looks like modulo power of p, uh, and, and, and what, what it looks like um, over, um, over, over the reals. So, so the kind of, the most refined forms predict the distribution of the rational points of V inside, well, the product over P of the, of the, of the piatic points of V times also the real points of V. Um, so e each of these, the, the, the piatic points and the real points each carry a topology, and it's very reasonable to ask, you know, how many, not just how many rational points there are, but how many rational points are contained in um, uh, contained in a um, a given like open set in that topology. Um, and then to do this, um, you want to predict a, a kind of measure on this space that the rational points are distributed according to. Um, and there's, there's, a very, there's a very natural measure to write down, especially in the, in the, in the piatic points, where you just assume you assume that every solution of the equations mod p is equally likely, and then you refine that slightly by assuming each solution mod p squared is equally likely. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so on, you take the, take the limit as the power of p goes, goes to infinity. Um, um, and so, but there is a possibly a brow Marlin obstruction yes. on this, so you have to exclude the locus. Yes, but then you yes, then you exclude the locus of brow Marlin obstructed. So, but but what is um, what is significant about that kind of prediction is it's not just predicting there's a lot of rational points when there's no obs local obstruction or no brow Marlin obstruction but predicting the rational points are evenly distributed over the space um, is that implies the rational points can't be contained in any kind of subvariety. If they were contained in a subvariety of V, they would not be evenly distributed over the piatic points, not be evenly distributed over the real points, they would be concentrated in a specific subset. Um, and the same thing for these covers. If there was a cover W to V, and all the rational points of V, or, or a high proportion of them, lifted to rational points of W, that the, the, the rational points would not be contained in, in evenly distributed over the whole space, they'd be contained in the image of WQP and, and the image of WR. They'd be contained in a small subset. Um, so so that's, that's, that's part of the reason why we have to get rid of the rational points in, 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 a, in a subset um, uh, and and um, and before making the, a, a, a prediction is you can't make like you can't make a good prediction that incorporates the rational point in the subset because they're not evenly distributed over the space. Um, um, so the. Question. And for the sub-varieties of covering, you can expect 
kind of diff, uh, large exponent of h? Uh, so, yeah, so the, so for, for, for sub variety, so there's, 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 there's three things that could go wrong for a sub variety recovering. One is that you have a large exponent, as you said, and that can only happen for sub varieties not covering. The other is you have the same exponent but a larger power of log. And the third thing is, you know, and then the third thing, which is it's sort of a, a, a matter of opinion how bad this is, you could have the same exponent and the same power of log, but some positive constant c, and you still want to get rid of them because you don't want uh, a positive portion of your rational points to be contained in some very weird subset of your variety. Um, and so, you know, all, 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 all three of those uh, can happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this, so, um, this set of finitely many subvarieties, I mean, and, and coverings, it might seem a little bit wishy-washy, like which, which finite set um, do, 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 do you mean? So there's kind of two points about this finite set. Um, so the finite set of subvarieties and coverings. So the first is that an explicit description was an explicit, well, let me say a geometric description of this set. Uh, was found by Lemon Singupta. Tiny motto. So there is there is some theorem that says there exists a geometric a unique. I don't know. There exists a finite set of subvarieties and coverings which has a such and such list of properties, um, and that's the one that you're supposed to use. Um, uh, and 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 the sort of the the hard part of that is using finiteness theorems for finite varieties to show that a set you describe is actually finite and, and not infinite. Um, but the second thing is any larger set should work. So if I if I, if I take the set of subvarieties you're supposed to remove and add some more subvarieties to it, this theorem is still true because the subvarieties I'm new subvarieties I'm adding contain very few of the remaining rational points. Um, so this is another kind of kind of uniqueness statement. If you have a set and any larger set should work, there's kind of only one, there's only one set. Well, there's there's if any larger set can do the same asymptotic, there's only one asymptotic. That has that property. You can't have two different asymptotics, which both become fixed for all large enough sets. What about the cover? Does it, is it clear that the cover gives only a small proportion of the points? Um, yeah, I think it's it's clear um, because you have some condition at each prime from from a cover, and the condition will be like a, a positive, you know, a portion between zero and one at each prime, and the multiple, the product over all p will go to zero. Um, if, if it's not, if it's not one of these bad covers, that's, I mean, that's what will happen. But I mean, of course, I mean, this isn't a theorem, it's just a conjecture, but um, that is, you know, that is in fact tr what happens in the cases of the conjecture we, 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 we can prove. No, I, I'm saying like for a billion variety where the, the group, the set of points is quite different, just finally generated, then you could have covers like multiplication by n, and then in fact all the point line, finite union of translates of the, Course it, so. Yeah, but but Fano varieties are not believed to behave like that, and in you know in many cases we can prove that they don't behave like that. Is is I mean, I mean I I, I believe this is true for for Fano varieties. So if 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 you can prove it's wrong, <laughs> that that would be that'd be interesting. But I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure it's true. Um, uh, 
So, 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 so these are reasons not to be too scared of this subset. Although there are there are definitely also reasons to be to be scared of the subset. Like they have a geometric description, but it's not clear from this description if we can always find out what it is in practice. Um, uh, um, and yeah, let, let me say something about what C is. So, so um, ignoring uh, the Brouwer mean obstruction, so when the Brouwer group of, of, of V vanishes, uh, C um, is, is given by like the product over primes P of the limit as n goes to infinity, the number of points of V defined over P to the n divided by P to the n times dimension of V uh, times 1 minus P inverse raised to the power B plus 1 times some integral times some kind of more boring factors. So the, the, the interesting part of the formula of C, for, from my point of view, is that it incorporates counting points of the variety mod, mod powers of prime. So the more points the variety has mod p to the n, the more likely it is to have a lot of rational points because every rational point has to come from the, one of these mod p to the n points. The mo more mod p to the n points you have, the more options you have to build a rational point in some sense. So you, you, you count mod p to the n points, you normalize it by the expected number, which is like roughly p to the n times dimension of v. That expectation isn't quite right, so you've got to normalize it by another factor of a power of 1 minus uh, p inverse and take, take a product o over primes p. Um, and, and then multiply that by some more boring stuff, and, and that gives you the constant c. So, so, so calculating the right constant c incorporates understanding kind of the, 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 mo the, 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 the local behavior of the variety, correspond, uh, understanding the p-adic points. Um, times, the power of the times the power of Picard, so power b plus 1. Yeah, p to the this is a p to the minus 1, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the source of the, the local obstructions that I mentioned earlier. If one of these sets is empty, if v of c mod p to the n is empty, this term will be 0, so the product will be 0, so the expected number of points is 0. If that doesn't happen, then at least as long as the Brouwer group vanishes, this expected product is positive. Um, so the, we, we, we then expect a large number of points. So we have, we have like an explicit criterion for when C is expected to be zero and we get no rational points versus when C is positive and we get a lot of rational points. Um, Can we write some values of zeta function of variety? Uh, yeah, so if, if V is smooth at P, then this local factor is the same as the local factor in the Hasseve zeta function of V. Of v. But you remove the second cohomology. Yes, you have to remove the second cohomology because the, the point we're evaluating it as, the zeta function has a pole coming from the second cohomology. So you have to, you have to cancel. Well, yeah, you only cancel the part of the second cohomology that's defined over Q. So if, you have, if, if your variety perhaps has additional divisor classes living over an extension of Q, those things will, will, will not give you a pole at that point. You do want to incorporate them into the product. We take out that pole because we want to get a finite answer, and then the pole reappears in this log factor. Uh, which is something that you, uh, you, you see commonly uh, in, in, in number theory when, when you're counting things, is, is that it, when you remove a pole, 
in some kind of zeta type thing, you get a log factor. And the integral is over the... the yes, yeah, so the integral is over the, 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 re the real points. Um, Um, and and the, uh, the exact form of the integral depends on my choice of height function because I put the, put the max here. You'll have some integral involving the L infinity norm. If I put something else like an L2 norm, you'd have an integral involving the L2 norm. Um, so, but part of the reason that I don't want to worry about the exact formula for the uh, real place is I'm going to immediately consider the analog with polynomials over a finite field and, and there we don't have a real place. All the places will be not our convenient. Um, so um, yeah, well first let me, let me say some of the kind of broader context of this conjecture. So this conjecture kind of unifies a bunch of results about counting rational points on various varieties that were proven uh, before. And since then, a lot of special cases have been proven. Um, like we, we know this kind of stuff for flag varieties and toric varieties and, and, and certain hypersurfaces in, in projective space and some Del Pezzo surfaces, but not others. Uh, so there's tons and tons of varieties we know this for, but of course there's even more varieties which we, which we don't know this for. Um, but it, it's something that people are making continual progress on. I think, you know, it feels like every, every month or something on Archive, someone has a new, like, rational point counting, counting result. Um, and uh, what I would like to consider next is the analog of that um, with, with polynomials over a uh, finite field. So we can take now V a variety inside projective space over now the field of rational functions in T, so the analog of, 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 of the rational numbers. Um, and then for simplicity, we will often like to assume that the coefficient, that the polynomials defining V are, are actually polynomials over the base finite field. They don't involve the variable t. Um, and th that will make certain, certain things simpler. Um, uh, and so here we're using, yeah, using the analogy between this and the rational numbers. Um, and then for uh, a point, uh, for a point in V inside, inside V of FQT inside PN FQT. Uh, we'll uh, define H of Y by first taking A0 to AN um, to have no common factors, or to be, to be polynomials in FQT, square brackets now, with no common factors. Uh, and then taking uh, setting h of y is equal to a max of the degree of the ai. Don't you want to take r ah, because capital H will be q to the small? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so capital H of y is, will be q to the little h of y. So, yeah, everything is a power of q, 
it, we might as well take the log. Uh, so, the, so the absolute value here is, is always the, the Q to the degree. So, so the analog of the, of the height would be, would be Q to the degree, but then everything to the power of Q, it's natural to take the logarithm to, to, to base Q, so we get uh, just an, an integer, an integer height. Say I forget that I'm dealing with a projective line. Suppose I have an algebraic curve. Yes. And I'm mapping x to my projective space, like to count the height. So what choices do I need to make? Here it looks like you chose a point, which is the infinity on P1. Um, okay, so let me, I will answer that question right now. So let me, let me give an alternate definition of height, and from this alternate definition, it's going to be clear what to do for a general algebraic curve. So the um, um, so the observation to, to make this more geometric uh, is y defines a map from P1 over FQ uh, to PN over FQ. So e, the, the, the N plus 1, because the N plus 1 coordinates of Y are functions, they're functions um, on the line over FQ, we can view them as coordinates of a function from the line to projective space. Um, and then the height of Y is equal to the degree of this map. So that's obviously invariant with respect to the transformations of PN, unlike yeah. that case. Correct. Yeah, so, so the, um, well, it's invariant under linear transformations of PN defined over FQ. So in this case, we didn't have uh, an FQ. If I had chosen the height as a sum of squares, over here, um, so some uh, in the, the L2 norm is on the squares, then it would be invariant under all linear transformations that preserve the L2 norm, which would sort of be the analog of GLN FQ. Um, uh, so, okay, so this suggests a natural definition of height for another algebraic curve, um, it, which is that we could consider the degree of a map from the algebraic curve. To, to, to projective space. Um, and is my eraser hiding under here somewhere, or is it down here? Most erasers yeah, eraser. Oh, over there. I see. Thank you. So, uh, we can make in this setting an analog of uh, Menin's conjecture. the number of y uh, in v of fqt of uh, 
let's say of height e um, is approximately q to the a times e times e to the b times c for again b is equal to rank and s of v minus 1, c is something explicit. Once we remove a bad set of points. Um, and so this is just, I just, it's natural to work with the logarithm to base q, so everything, the logarithm transformed into a linear thing, and, and, and this transformed into, into an exponential. But there, I think that there is, should be an obvious problem here, because you can use the so-called, I think, Veronese embedding that is multiplies the degree, so that if you have got a projective space embedded, a PN embedded very large one is a sub-variety, then, um, then the degree will become, even, let us say, divisible by the, by the d, which is used for this Veronese embed. Okay, right. So I, I guess right. So I guess what I should say is that c is explicit, but it may not be an explicit constant. It might instead be an explicit periodic function of of e. Um, uh, well, I, I said height equal to e, but even if it was less or equal to, you would have this periodicity problem because, y yeah. Um, in 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 the cases I consider, that won't be won't be a problem. <laughs> it will it will not be these 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 Veronese's. So, so what he's saying is if you choose, if, if, if the line bundle O of 1 happens to be, say, the square of another line bundle, then the degree is always going to be even. So the number of points of height E will be probably very large for even E and, and 0 for odd E. Um, and uh, It was a more precise conjecture, it's kind of leading term for asymptotic, but if you make like high zeta function, it will have some little meromorphic continuation, and this asymptotic will be first ball, which you see for zeta function. And uh, did people make more optimistic conjecture that you go a little bit beyond the obvious radius of convergence? Um. So, uh, that's a good question. So you have to be, um, you have to be careful. So the thing you have to be careful about, maybe this is okay. So the, so that, that's, re that's related to the question of kind of what is the error term? of this estimate, right? If the error term, if the difference between the number of rational points and this formula is, 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 is a smaller power of x, then in some kind of height zeta function, we could get a, um, you know, it should extend, you should get a single pole coming from this main term and then, and then some analytic continuation beyond. And so for that question of when this estimate has a power saving error term, there you get problems when the Picard rank is greater than one, because the rational points, well, I'll just, okay, I'll just say in a special case, you take a product of two protective spaces, a pretty high proportion of the rational points are coming from pairs of points on the protective spaces where one has very large height and one has very small height. And so getting a power saving asymptotic for the total number of rational points in protective spaces require, or the product of two protective spaces would require getting a power saving asymptotic for the number of points of very, very small height, which is sort of absurd because the number of points of very small height is always going to be a contingent, like it's not going to be given by any really nice formula, like how many points are there in a very small box. 
So you, you, you don't get power savings unless, like if B is zero, it, it, you have a greater reason to believe them. And if, 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 if B is greater than zero, there are things you can do to get rid of the bad terms and like focus on the good terms and then you expect power savings. Um, but then I don't know if that causes a problem for the height zeta function because maybe it ends up being just a kind of a product of like for the product of predictive spaces, the height zeta function just end up being a product of the height zeta functions in the individual predictive spaces. So so maybe. Um, ah, so so b will be order of pole for. Yeah. So 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 we'll b is like the order of pole minus one. one. Yeah, b plus one is the order of pole. Yeah, um, and. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I definitely, yeah, I think in the case where the, the poll is order one, I think it's, it's certainly, I think people expect that it should continue a little bit beyond. And when the, when the order of the poll is higher than one, um, I don't know what people expect. Um, and so pretty much all the techniques that people apply in number theory to prove cases of Menin's conjecture um, should apply also in the setting of polynomials or finite fields. And for some of them, it's been checked. Um, for for other ones, it, it hasn't. Um, but I want to uh, follow the <laughs> theme of this series of talks and look for the geometric interpretation of, of this conjecture. So, and there's, 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 let me give two geometric interpretations, one slightly more general than the other. Um, and so it has to do with this observation that the coordinates of y define a map from p1 to pn, um, and, and vice versa, any map from p1 to pn uh, defines, defines a, um, a rational point of, 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 of pn. So, um, um, and then the rational points of pn come from rational points of V if and only if the map from P1 to Pn lands in V. So the simplest case is if V is defined over FQ. Uh, there, there's a bijection between rational, rational points of V of height E uh, and maps from P1 FQ to V FQ of degree E. Um, so when we're counting these rational points of a given height and, and conjecture and asymptotic, we might as well be count, counting maps from the projective line of a given degree and conjecturing an asymptotic. So I can't help asking this. So, just, I don't know, turn off pretty soon. Uh, if you replaced here maps by quasi maps, Will it change the estimates using term or not? Um, so, so, by, so by, by quasi maps, you're essentially saying we should allow this tuple of polynomials to have common factors, right? Yeah. So that will that should um, that should change the asymptotic merely by changing c, and the amount it changes the constant c is something that's totally explicit um, and 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 is predictable because if you have if you have the original version, you can prove the quasi map version. If you have the quasi map version, you can prove the original version. Um, uh, um, and uh, and 
And so in the general case, if V is not necessarily defined over FQ, it doesn't make sense to have a map from P1 FQ to VFQ because there is no VFQ. Um, but what you can just do is say that V extends uh, to some closed subset curly V inside Pn times P1 over FQ. Um, and there's a bijection between y and v of fqt. Um, of height. Should, should, should be the same as, as sections of v goes to p1 of degree. Um, well, the same as curves in V of degree E1. Yes, yes, curves in V of degree E comma 1 is, is another way of saying it. Um, but I, th I think curves in a general product of varieties of degree E comma 1 might behave badly, whereas curves, specifically sections, of degree e, like of, of, of degree e, are, are 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 more likely to be better behaved. So it is like, the, yeah. um, and so and so. Um, both of these geometric descriptions are rational points of some varieties. So th so th th this one is. We always call it sec E of V, the FQ points. Because if you have some moduli space whose points over any field parameterize sections defined over that field, the FQ points will, will be the sections. Um, and, and, and the other one you could say is um, maybe more E of morphisms of degree E from P1 to V of FQ points, uh, and you could also say it's the moduli space of genus zero curves with zero marked points on V of degree E FQ points, but then you have to multiply by Q cubed minus Q because this more moduli space is defined by modding out by automorphisms of P1 and uh, so you have to add them back in to, to get the, the number we care about. I mean, it's conjecture. Um, oh yeah, you could also do. Yes, you could do it with with, with, with three 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 marked points. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a normalization factor for for the constant. Um, so we can apply the Groth and Lefschetz fixed point formula to turn these number theoretic problems about counting rational points, which we expressed as counting FQ points of these varieties, we can turn them into questions about the cohomology of these varieties. Um, and uh, uh, at least one member of the audience requested a break. I'm thinking maybe we could take uh, like a short, maybe just like five minute break and then people will be a, maybe a little bit more sharp when, when, when they come back. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's, let's take a break just for like five minutes. Okay, so basically the question is what geometric properties of 
yeah, let's say let's say the moduli space of sections. But you can think about you can think of one of these other ones if, if you prefer, because what I'm going to say is, is is basically equivalent. Um, what geometric properties uh, would imply this counting? Imply mon and pair. Um, and so there's there's a there's a general fact about counting points on on varieties, which is um, the, the 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 highest degree cohomology groups tend to dominate in in Lefschetz form, formula. To dominate y of fq, especially as, as q grows, because here is where we have the highest eigenvalues of, um, of Frobenius, and so the, the dimension of this group, this has dimension equals the number of irreducible components of y. What? Of, of maximal dimension. <laughs> um, so when we're when we're thinking about what geometric properties of variety explain the point counting, often it's first going to be what is the dimension uh, 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 of the space. Then, how many irreducible components of that dimension does it have? And, and then, second, what are the cohomologies of the individual components? Um, in, in particular, many of the spaces we're considering will be to, I, will be provably or expected to be equidimensional, so all their components will have the same dimension. Um, and then. <laughs> What you find in, for this problem is that the geometric properties that you need uh, to, to make this work are all properties that can be uh, justified separately. You have a, you have a separate reason for, for believing the same, the, the same thing. Uh, I, th I think this was first pointed out by uh, uh, Batirev, at, at least for the dimension of the number of... Baterev. Oh, sa same principle, I guess. <laughs> okay. I, I, okay. Let me, let me, let me see how many, how many Russian names I'll end up with by the, by the end of my <laughs> series of lectures. Um, Baterev, uh, and um, I, I mean, uh, there, there, there also going to be an, an observation of Ellenberg and, 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 and Venkatesh in here. So. Um, so the dimension um, is, is kind of coming mostly from this, this a factor, this q to the a times e factor. So the dimension of sec e of v f q should be a e plus dm v. Um, actually, let me let me do morphisms because yes, yeah, some some things I want to say will be slightly more complicated if it's if it's morphism. So let me just like, like for example this. Let me do m more e of p one. Uh, so there, there's versions of everything I'm saying for sections, but I'm mostly going to say it for morphisms because it'll be simple. Um, so the expected dimension is AE plus DMV, um, and this is, is justified by deformation theory. It's, 
the tangent space to more e p1 v at a map f is h0 of p1 pull back under f of the tangent bundle of v. Um, and by Riemann-Roch, the dimension of h0 p1 f star tv minus the dimension of h1 of p1 f star tv is equal to the rank of f star tv plus the degree of f star tv which is equal to dim v plus uh, a times e um, because the, the, the degree is calculated by integrating the term class and so that gives us uh, a uh, and then times the degree e and, and the rank is, is dim v. So um, the prediction that the, the dimension is given by this formula is basically the prediction that for a typical point, this h1 should, should be 0, um, which is a very natural prediction to make in, in deformation theory. That's what we see often for a lot of moduli spaces of interest, although obviously not, not all the time. Um, And then to understand um, the second factor, the power of e, we, we need to observe that this degree e of a map from p1 to v is really one piece of a larger um, uh, invariant, which is the the well, either the class, the class of the image of E inside the, uh, like the Chow group of, of curves on, on, on X, um, or equivalently we can say the, um, uh, the, like the, the pairing of, or the, 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 pull, the degree of the pullback along E of, of, of various line bundles. So, um, For f p1 to v, like f star, the class of p1, um, uh, um, a class in basically the neuron severity group of v dual. So you can, given any line bundle on V, you can pair it with this class by pulling it back along F and taking the degree. Uh, and so this is a um, vector space. There's some lattice in it of integer points coming from curves. With lattice of curve classes. Um, and then the lattice also contains a cone of classes which have a non-negative pairing. Or, 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 or I'll say of, of NEF classes. Classes that have a non-negative pairing with each effective divisor. And because we're interested in curves that don't lie in any subvariety, we're interested in curves that have, have NEF um, classes. 
Um, and so what we should expect, so a natural expectation is that each like integral nef class has one irreducible component. So the 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 this invariant, the class of a, of a curve, is, is, is locally constant in families. So it's constant on connected components of this moduli space. So we, we have an explanation for why this moduli space may have multiple components, is it might have different connected components associated to different curve classes. Um, and and, and the, the expectation that's con consistent with Manin's conjecture is that the um, each, each class, or at least most of the classes, corresponds to only one component. Um, uh, and, 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 and so that's kind of the only, ex that's the only reason that, y that you, you, you'd fail to be able to deform one curve into another. Yeah. No, but it should be the same k that you could have some varieties which can produce things of larger dimension. Exactly. So the, both of these statements should be, yes, it should really apply to this modular space once I remove all rational curves containing some bad subvarieties, and once I remove all rational curves that lift to some bad covers, or I should be making these statements in cases where there are no bad subvarieties and there are no bad covers. That, 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 that's a good point. But the notion of NEF, I've seen it uh, in the literature, usually it is for, not for the dual of neuron severity, yeah, so in neuron severity there is a notion of NEF. I think it's called effective cycles. And uh, what, is, what do you mean by NEF in your setup of the dual? I, I, so I, I just want it to have a non-negative pairing with every effective divisor. In neuron severity, I, I think it's called the, the Mori. Oh, it's some sort of effective one cycles. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sexual okay. sexual cycles. Yeah. Effective one cycles. No negative. So you have effective, which is bigger. I mean, you have effective in the sense of given by a positive. The positive positive in, Yeah. And there, there is a, the strongest thing is non negative uh, intersection number, which seems to exclude the things that lie in some special. Uh yeah, so I, 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 want, I want my curves to have non negative intersection number with all honest effective divisors. I don't want to consider divisors that have non negative intersection number with all curves. Effective, simple divisors, yeah. Non negative intersections. No, with all, with all effective, negative intersection with all effective divisors, not negative. So it's, it's because I'm, I'm, if, if there is some divisor which is not ample, is, you know, some no divisor which is very hard to move, the only way my curves could have negative intersection with it is if they li live on that divisor. And there's kind of two possibilities. Either most of my curves don't live on the divisor. It's kind of like movable curves. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't care. Or if there are lots of curves that live on the divisor, I really want to throw them out. So yeah, I'm, I'm yes, yeah, so yeah, movable. Yeah, so the, the cone of yeah, we could say maybe movable curve classes. More. Yeah. So the, okay. So whatever it's called, I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like I've seen people call. It, I feel like Pear calls it the Neff cone. Maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, anyways, it, it is the cone of things that have non-negative pairing with all divisors. Um, and so the where this power of b comes from is the number of points on the cone that have degree e uh, will depend on the dimension of the cone. Like if you have a cone of dimension 2, the ones whose pairing with the hyperplane class as e will form a, a slice of the cone like this, and the number of integer points you get will be uh, approximately linear in e, maybe linear. Um, and, and similarly, if, if the cone has dimension b plus 1, you'll get a power of e to the b, will be the approximate number of classes. But of course, if there is torsion in the homology, let's say classical homology, or at all, I mean, the, in H, then there could be different components. So uh, like, because it, the, the curve is also an integral class. Yes. Um, 
Yes, and so then and yeah, and then, so in that case, you want to expect that. Yeah, you you yeah. So I uh, right. I, I so I should really say, integer integer classes here whose real point lie in this effective cone or the lie in this Mori cone, and then. All these geometric predictions, I will only ever believe them are that they're true exactly far from the boundary of this cone. Because if I'm near to the boundary of this cone, weird stuff can happen. If I'm in a product of two varieties, I could be very low degree in one of the varieties. Low degree curves don't always behave as expected. Uh, and, and so when, when we're making precise geometric statements, we want to stay a certain distance from the cone. Um, from the boundary of the cone. And this is, so this is related to what I was saying for the height zeta function. To get power savings in the estimate, you want to stay a, a, a substantial distance away from, from the boundary of the cone. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe one should consider like a multivariate height zeta function using, using different, different classes. Um, uh, and then, So that's dimension, this is the number of components, and then the cohomology of each component. So of each component. Um, and so this is where things get kind of strange. Um, I'm going to give a kind of weird, <laughs> uh, it should match the cohomology of one component of um, the continuous homomorphisms from P1 to V. P1 to C to V of C. So, um, L l let me explain what I mean by this. Let me first explain what I mean over the complex numbers and then explain how that still has some meaning over a finite field. Um, so, um, so over the complex numbers, this was a conjecture that was originally made in the setting of topology by, by, by Siegel, I think. So here, so if we have a variety over the complex numbers, we're looking, this, this more E is a modulized space of holomorphic maps from the projective line to the, our, our complex variety. And you could compare this space of holomorphic maps to a space of continuous maps. The holomorphic maps embed into the continuous map. Uh, from, from the projective line of C, which would just be a sphere into this variety. Um, and, and, and the conjecture is that the cohomology should match in, uh, in low degrees the cohomology of the modular spaces of continuous maps. So you somehow can't tell that the maps you're working with are only holomorphic and not arbitrary continuous maps. Um, uh, if you only look at like the low, the low degree cohomology. Um, it's strange, you're interested in top degree cohomology. Yes, so that's because topologists will generally not work in compactly supported cohomology. And they like working with manifolds. So this, this is the conjecture is in low degree cohomology or in top uh, compactly supported cohomology. Continuous maps does make sense. Yeah, so for continuous maps, compactly supported cohomology doesn't make sense. So what you do is you take the low degree cohomology of continuous maps, then you dualize that and you shift the degree because you already know what the dimension should be. So, so you only make this conjecture after you check the dimension is right. And then you say the compactly supported cohomology in degree twice dimension minus i should be dual to the ordinary cohomology of continuous maps in degree i. Anyway, but naively it seems to be absurd because you have orientation reversing map of P1c to itself, so degree minus 1 
Uh, and I fix a degree. Yeah. yeah, so you have to fix you have to fix one component of the of the modular space of continuous maps, and that will that will involve fixing the degree. No, but I'm saying that there are more more because you don't need the uh, you don't have positivity. You can have maybe I get it wrong, but you have in rotation reversing map of the sphere to to itself like z going to z bar, and this is not holomorphic. Yeah, but you also can't deform it. You can't deform it into a holomorphic map. Like, so we're, we're considering only one component, and the component means we're fixing the degree, and the anti-holomorphic map has negative degree. So this kind of global anti-holomorphic map will not appear in this conjecture, because they always have negative degree, and we're only considering a single component, which is a component that has positive degree. However, it is absolutely true that we can have in this conjecture a locally, in this model of continuous maps, we'll have a locally anti-holomorphic map. We'll have a map which has overall positive degree, but in some, over some piece of P1, it could absolutely be anti-holomorphic. It just can't be, um, and yeah, it's, co it's completely bizarre that, that despite this, yeah, the space of continuous maps is enormously larger, contains enormously more maps than the space of holomorphic maps, but somehow they are approximating each other homologically. Um, this is also special to the final case? Yeah, so this is a conjecture that, so I, th I think Siegel even made it l in less than the Fano case. He, he kind of just gave an explicit list of varieties, but I think that people would, na would now make the conjecture for Fano varieties with the same, yeah, you have, to, you have to remove the bad points in the same way that you do uh, in the number theory setting. Um, and so, and then yeah, so then you should have in low, in, this is high degree compactly supported cohomology, and more and more degrees should, sh cohomology should agree as the degree of the maps increases. Uh, and so when the modulate space is smooth, it doesn't matter which of these two statements you make, when it is singular, these two statements might be different. So the compactly supported cohomology one is the one that's relevant for Monin's conjecture. Monin. <laughs> and I don't really know, I don't know if we should believe the low degree ordinary cohomology one also in, in the singular case, if, 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 that's, if that's sort of a more natural statement um, or not. I'm not really sure. Why is this statement important to uh, see the asymptotics? Like the first two are clear. So, okay, so right. So well, well, let me say, what is this? What sh what should this even mean in the finite field setting? And so, because I mean, obviously, this hom continuous doesn't 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 exist in the finite field setting. So what you can do is you can calculate the cohomology of this 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 space of continuous maps. You can calculate it algebraically in the topological world using I mean, in some sense, using, using Sullivan's rational homotopy theory, another way of saying it is that as soon as you add a marked point to here, here, then this, is, this moduli space of maps from the sphere into your space is a double loop space. And there's a formula for the cohomology of a double loop space. Uh, and so you, what you do is you take that algebraic formula in terms of like the cohomology algebra of V, and you can just convert that into a formula that makes sense for Ital cohomology for, for, for cohomology. For instance, this even low degree cohomology depends on the a priori degree of your rational, of your yeah. one, yeah? Yeah. Um, but yes. So, and then that kind of algebraic formula, there's a natural action of Frobenius on it. So using the action of Frobenius on V, you can sort of guess from the algebraic formula for this what the cohomology of this space of honest algebraic maps should look like with the action of Frobenius. And so once you guess it with the action of Frobenius, you can plug it into Lefschetz's fixed point formula. Um, and I, I think what, 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 uh, what Ellenberg and, and, and Van observed is if you do this, you see what you get, it just matches exactly Pear's explicit formula for the constant in Monin's conjecture. Is it enough that it's independent of Q? Like the low degree, uh, like just the dimensions. No, you you get the wrong constant. So if, so for example, I mean the simplest thing the cohomology could be 
is that it would vanish in all degrees except for the top compactly subordinate degree. Um, and so with what you would get then is your constant would be just basically a power of q, or maybe a power of q times some rational number related to the volume of, of this cone. Yeah. Constant q times the volume of this cone. And that's not the right formula. So it really matters exactly what the cohomology is. It, it has to be this because it's giving, it's, it's giving lower order terms. Lower order in terms of q terms, but these terms might be very significant if um, uh, th these could be very significant for a particular value of q. I mean, so yeah, I mean, an extreme case is v could have no fq points. So there's no maps from p1 to v to find over fq, but there's lots of maps to find over fq of r. This moduli space is a totally valid variety. It has lots of cohomology. So what you should see happen in this case is the contributions of different cohomology classes to, to, to the trace of Rebanius cancels. Uh, and that's something that you can see happens by working with the algebraic formula for this, this cohomology. By the way, with this algebraic formula, I guess there's a little bit of care with thinking of it as S2, right? Because Frobenius will also be acting on, in yes. some sense, on the algebraic formula you build using some whatever it is, E2 uh, thing. Yeah, okay, but I guess they took care of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, also a comment, I mean, it makes perfect sense in the finite field world if you just interpret everything with a tall homotopy. Um, so, um, I mean, there's... Yes, so... Yeah, that, 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 that's an interesting point. I, th there is, th there are other... There's, so there's, there's a couple different approaches that I know of for making a, a finite field interpretation of that that should all be provably equivalent. Um, but uh, so far, no one has written down a proof that they are, in fact, equivalent to each other and uh, equivalent and, and have the properties you want them to have. But maybe we should talk about the etal homotopy. Uh, ver version. Maybe before we had uh, you remove this bed subarrangement, yeah? Yeah. And uh, I remember, so just a long time ago, I don't know whether this works, you can count uh, uh, all points but with weights q to minus rank of h1 or pullback of a tangent bundle. Kind of thing, which kind of seems to cancel at least dimension issue. Um. Well, that's, so, so in that case, bad sub varieties will be giving you a contribution to the count that's comparable to yeah. the good points. And so we really want them to be giving a contribution that's smaller than the good points. Yeah. Um, so, so... It should be corrupted by something, but it looks like a good approximation. Yeah, so... It makes sense also in a number field to consider height in the count in the determinant of canonical bundle at this point. Um, yeah, there, yeah there, might be, there might be something interesting in that direction. I mean, one thing that uh, let me point out is if you, away from the bad sub-varieties, you're changing the weighting of the singular points slightly. Um, that probably shouldn't be a, a, a problem. So m most points, once you get rid of the bad sub-varieties, most points should be smooth. And so changing the weight of the singular points shouldn't change the asymptotic. Um, and so this is, this is related to um, Pear's kind of freeness perspective on Monmouth's conjecture. Um, and, and so removing the singular points also has the advantage that you don't have to choose between low degree cohomology and top degree compactly supported cohomology. So, for example, if the tangent bundle is uh, generically generated by global sections, then you, you get some, some sufficient condition for vanishing of the H1, namely that the curve doesn't lie the generic part of the curve lies in the locus where... Yeah, so... so, the, the, so I'm not sure if there are other... what you do in general, how you, you, you get it something that ensures the vanishing of H1. Yeah, so... yes. So, so the cases where the tangent bundle is generically globally generated, like flag varieties and toric varieties, are cases where a number of things become easier. In particular, as you, you point out, it becomes smooth uh, under, under a nice condition. And those are also the cases uh, where 
uh, we can prove many or all of the, these conjectures and we can prove the, the arithmetic statements. Um, so, okay, yeah, let, let, me, let me come back to that. I'll, I'll, I'll make, I'll make uh, a remark. Let me, so, I want to talk about kind of what's known. Um, Uh, uh, um, so the, the dimension and uh, component statements are now known in great generality for all Fano vibrations in, in characteristic zero over C uh, by uh, Lemon, Riedel, uh, and Tani Moto. Um, this, is, this is a recent result. Um, so they, um, they, they really proved it for a general Fano variety um, and an arbitrary curve. So any, any family with a generic member Fano over a curve. Um, and there's, there's only Three weaknesses of this. So, okay, let me say. So this was this was build. This is this is generalizing earlier work. Uh, work of um, starting of, of a number of people in algebraic geometry, starting with Star and ending with work of of, of Riedel and 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 and, and Yang, um, who. Um, we're studying proving dimension irreducibility statements for moduli space of curves on general hypersurfaces in projective space. So they were having techniques that worked for specifically hypersurfaces in projective space. Um, and they were actually using techniques that were building on these, these moduli spaces of curves and their compactifications, where the curves will then degenerate into unions of curves and trying to do an inductive argument using those compactifications. Um, the, the, the new work, it kind of relies very crucially on, 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 on arguments involving, involving vector bundles. Um, and so this is, this is uh, a kind of very powerful statement. However, it doesn't t tell us about any of the cohomology groups beyond the top degree. It also only works over the complex numbers. Um, and it has a third problem that it's expressed in terms of these bad subvarieties and bad covers, but it doesn't really give you a practical way to tell what those bad subvarieties and bad covers are. Um, so there's many special cases where you would expect that there's no bad subvarieties and no bad covers, but you can't always prove it use, using these methods. Uh, You often can, but but not always. Um, uh, so uh, that's for the 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 dimension um, and irreducibility statements. Oh, let me mention one thing about this dimension statement that's kind of interesting. So these moduli spaces of curves in varieties um, attract er, a lot of interest in gromov witten theory, where you calculate certain intersection numbers on these moduli spaces. Um, and there's very little relationship between the 
understanding the dimension and irreducibility and cohomology of these moduli spaces versus calculating these intersection numbers, except that if you know the moduli spaces have the expected dimension, you know that the intersection numbers are really counting something, that they're enumerating something, uh, you know, they're, they're actually enumerating curves going through a certain number of general points rather than, uh, you know, ha having this more kind of abstract notion of enumeration. So that, that, that's kind of nice, is that you can prove using these results in, in, in many cases that the, um, the invariants actually enumerate something concrete. Um, and then for, for the, for the cohomology, um, it's kind of a funny story in that people were working on this problem in a topological setting, trying to calculate the cohomology of these spaces, um, like independently from the work in number theory, um, and not really thinking about the fact that there, there could be this connection bet between them, uh, as far as I know. Um, and so, Ellenberg and Venkatesh, when they looked at this and they realized there was this connection, they got really excited. They're like, we're going to take some of these theorems in topology, calculating the cohomology of these moduli spaces. We're going to like apply them to an algebra, you know, a characteristic p-setting, and we'll use them to prove new cases of Monin's conjecture. Um, and then they looked at like the list of cases and they found that every case people had done in topology, number theorists had also already figured out how to do. So, or, or okay, number theorists and algebraic geometers, because algebraic geometers were gonna connect with you. So th there, there, was no, there was kind of no hope of going from the topology setting to, um, to characteristic, to, to, to the number theory. Um, and then they noticed that there are some cases that people could do in the number theory setting, but couldn't do in topology. And this is specifically the case of low degree hypersurfaces. Um, so, uh, let me mention that. So for low degree hypersurfaces in PM, the counting Uh, is known, uh, but the cohomology is unknown. Um, and then I got excited again and was like, well, there's certain cases where you can reverse the left shut's fixed point formula, and from knowing information about the, the FQ points on a space, you can produce information about the cohomology of the space. So you you hear care, care about constant now, yeah, in, in the asymptotics oh, okay. Yes, yes. So, so for the for not, not about A B, but about constants, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. So the um. um so the, you, you, the other thing you could try to do is to take the results from number theory and apply them to answer this topological or geometric problem about the cohomology of the moduli space of curves and hypersurface. But unfortunately, the moduli space of curves and hypersurface is not one of the varieties where if you know its rational points, that tells you uh, its topology. So this works for smooth projective varieties, great, from the vague conjectures. If we know how many points they have over each finite field, we know their cohomology groups. But the moduli space of curves and hypersurface is usually not smooth and usually not projective. So it just doesn't seem to work at all. It's also not the complement of a hyperplane arrangement or anything else special like that. Um, so you, you got kind of stuck, is that we knew something on the, the number theory side, but didn't know um, any, any geometric kind of explanation for it, which is strange because typically the situation is, is our geometric and topological methods are stronger in a lot of ways than, than purely arithmetic methods. Um, Uh, 
Um, so what? Um, so I worked on this a, a few years ago with, with with Tim Browning, and we fixed this sort of. So we we didn't consider this exact problem of the modulate morphisms from P1 to a hypersurface in projective space. Um, instead, we worked with hypersurfaces in affine spaces because it turned out to be slightly easier for our method. Um, but what we did is we, 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 we proved a result about the topo topology of these moduli spaces not, uh, in a case where you know how to count their rational points. Not by using the count of rational points, but by adapting the methods used to count rational points to geometric methods, to, to kind of adapting them, transforming them into methods in the theory of, of sheaf cohomology. Um, and we, we got a, a description of their, of their cohomology, which I guess I'll, I guess I'll write down and then I'll stop. So, um, X inside A N. Um, okay. Be a hypersurface. Uh, defined by a polynomial of degree D in N variables. F or, uh, over a field K. Um, and so I want to make, so I want to work in the affine case and not the projective case, and I want to make the strongest smoothness assumption I could, which is that assume uh, X is smooth and the leading term of F also defines a smooth hypersurf. Smooth hypersurface. So it's like in projective space you get to copy to generic hyperplane. Yeah. Um, exactly, yeah. In Pn minus one. Um, yeah, in Pn minus one. And then we'll fix Fix P inside that hypersurface. And then we'll define more EP of A1 to X to be tuples, the moduli space of tuples of degree E polynomials. Uh, solving solving f whose leading terms match leading coefficients are e1 up to e n. Um, so in general, m maps from a1 to x are tuples of degree of, of polynomials which solve the equation f. And so I'm fixing the degree of the equation, and it's a little bit more convenient for me to fix also the leading um, the leading term. So I'm kind of have a marked point at infinity, which I'm sending to a specific point on the hypersurface at, at infinity. And you're fixing it or up to scalar, maybe it doesn't. Uh, well, yeah, it just changes the cohomology by a factor of GM, basically. But yeah, I'm, I'm fixing it not up to scalars, is it, 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 the thing that's slightly nicer for me. So then this is the stuff that gets really complicated to write down. Um, 
Um, so then we need to fix fix a prime L. Um, if the characteristic of K is positive, we need to assume the characteristic of K is greater than D, or yeah, it's greater than D, and L has even order modulo the characteristic of K, which is probably the weirdest assumption on the characteristic that you've ever seen. Um, uh, let E be greater than or equal to D minus 1, which we're also going to assume is greater than or equal to 2, and N greater than 2 to the D times D minus 1. So we need the number of variables to be enormously larger than the degree for our method to work, and this comes from the number theory. The, the number theoretic method we use is only valid if the number of variables is exponentially larger than the degree. Then there is a spectral sequence. Uh, okay, I'll just say the first page is explicit rather than writing it down. Um, computing HI more DP P1 X K bar QL for I greater than uh, 2 times D times M minus K, which is the expected dimension. Uh, minus 4, or so 2 times e times minus k, e over d minus 1 floor function times n over 2 to the d minus d plus 1 minus 1. Is this guy smooth or not? This space of morphism. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let, let, let me show So we don't know that the space of morphism is smooth. It, it probably isn't, in particular, if you have like a line uh, and, then a, and then a multiple cover of the line. Um, but the um, uh, in a different paper of mine with Tim, we, we use the same number theoretic method to prove a bound on the dimension of the singular locus of these kinds of moduli spaces. Okay, that one we did in the protective space, but the method certainly would have worked in, in the affine case as well. So we can certainly prove as long as n is greater than three half, three three halves of this, so a little bit larger on n, we can prove an upper bound on the dimension of the singular locus, and the, and the, the co-dimension of the singular locus we show is growing as e goes to infinity. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so as, uh, um, as I was mentioning earlier, we, we're we, we only expect the cohomology to be computable in, in high compactly supported degrees. So we take the dimension of the um, variety and then a, a, a few degrees below that where the number of degrees is growing with E. So this... So, 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 so since the rocks are probably not seen, not seen this. Yeah. Or, or, oh, yeah. uh, because uh, single locus is, has very high co-dimensions contribute to uh, things far from. Y yes, yes. Um, well, our, 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 yeah, so it depends on exactly what the dimension is, exactly how our bound for the co co single locus uh, compares to this. But there, yeah. And so this, this, this lower bound on n is also the condition that is required for this term we're subtracting to be growing with e. Because yeah, you want n over 2 to the d minus d plus 1 to be positive. Um, um, and, and, and then, um, yeah, I mean, when, when, you, when d is small, the problem kind of becomes too, too easy. It sort of trivializes, so that's not kind of not the interesting case. And then there's some, we have some weird conditions on the characteristic that are, that are technical uh, artifacts of the method. Um, okay, so since we're out of time, I should stop there and ask for questions.
do something crazy, things that can count instead of two variables, of two variables or, or, or one variable, like names of three one. Yeah. Yeah. Do like a cubic and because the names of two variables and you, if you cubic has very large dimension, very large dimension, dimension is also. Yeah, that's that's uh, I I I don't know. So I thought about applying the the circle method to those problems, and it and it seems very hard. There is some potential to get a little bit of of information from a certain like recently developed methods of variance of the circle method, but I I, I don't know how much you can do and, and to what extent it's competitive with like the purely geometric methods. I mean, you would certainly need very enormously large number of variables, right? Because we already need an exponentially large number of variables for this case. Oh yeah, sorry. Well, maybe one more thing I want to say about this. So we have the spectral sequence, and then what we expect is that all the differentials in the spectral sequence vanish. If all the differentials vanish, then the Betty numbers we get out of the spectral sequence match this, this projection. Um, but we, we, we didn't in the paper figure out how to show that they all fit. So, but you had some confusion of D and D, I don't know. Oh, did I? Oh, you're right. Yes. Okay. I, this okay. Let me let me try to fix all. So I think hopefully that's the only one. That is okay. That is a. Yeah. So I think I fixed e, all the E and D problems. So the D is the degree of the original uh, hypersurface, and E is the degree of the curve. E is the degree of the curve, and the and more E P is where you fix the leading, uh, the leading yeah. or or fix up to a scalar. Fix it not up to a scalar. So really, yeah, really, really fix the leading coefficients. Um, <coughs> small k is. Uh, so oh. Oh. Uh, Field K? Yeah, I have a field capital K, yeah. And what but is in the what is small K? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, um. It's what, 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 what is small K? In oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, that's right. Okay, that should be a D also. Sorry about that. that yeah, I tried. I Probably that was a bad idea that I uh, f changed it from the notation that's in the paper to the more common notation in the field. But yeah, I, I, I messed up those two. So, so this roughly means that when you write down the the conditions some of them are independent when you write down generic I mean the leading yeah. and the put arbitrary coefficients for the lower ones and you expect this to be kind of a complete intersection given by exactly exactly yeah and you, and you can prove so it's much easier to prove using our method that's a complete intersection of the expected dimension the paper would have been much shorter and so and in fact for the projective hypersurfaces. The analog of this was done by um, Browning and and Pankaj Visha, so uh, and then b b and, and so that's that's because you can use Langve to calculate the, the dimension if you know the number of rational points, um, and so what we're doing is 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 extending that to get the cohomology and not just the dimension, which requires taking this analytic method, the circle method, and transforming it step by step into a method in sheaf cohomology, so transforming every function that appears into a sheaf and every operation on functions into the corresponding operation on sheaves. In particular, you get a complete intersection in the end as well. Yes, it's a complete intersection.